Hi peoples, today we will be looking at Baal, the Canaanite god of rain and fertility, and one of the most important gods of that pantheon. Now it must be noted that the word Baal simply means owner or lord, and is not a proper name, but rather a title. From ancient texts though, we know that the term Baal was used to designate the West Semitic god of fertility, who was also called Prince Lord of Earth, Lord of Rain and Dew, he who rides on the clouds, and almighty Baal, while in Phoenician he was called Baal Shamen, meaning Lord of the Heavens. From texts like the Baal cycle found at Ukarit, which was located on the Mediterranean coast of northern Syria, we know that Baal's proper name was Hadat, and so he is often called Baal Hadat, or Lord Hadat. Before we get started properly, I would just like to give a shout out to JS for requesting this video. If there are any gods you would like me to feature on this channel, leave a comment down below and I'll gladly make a video. Ok, now let's take a closer look at who Baal was to the ancient world. Stories about Baal date back to the mid-14th and late 13th centuries BCE in written form, but are understood to be much older, preserved by oral tradition until committed to writing. Excavations from the ancient city of Ugarit modern day Rashamra, have revealed thousands of cuneiform tablets telling the tales of the gods and specifically Baal, who was considered king of the gods. Associated with kingship and oaths, his name appears as a divine witness to international treaties and as a common element in theophoric names, examples of which can be found in the Hebrew Bible such as Saul's son, Ishbal, and his grandson, Merib Baal. Baal was venerated in West Semitic religious traditions as a powerful god and patron of humanity for over 2,000 years. Now Baal Hadad originated in Mesopotamia under the names Adat in the north and Ishgur in the south. He is attested as early as the time of the Akkadian Empire, but became more popular during the First Babylonian Empire around 1894 to 1595 BCE. But even then, he was not a major deity and was often depicted as a subordinate to the storm god Nenurta, who was a kind of personal secretary to the great god Enlil. It was during this time, though, that the bull became associated with him as his sacred animal, which would become a prominent aspect of his iconography in later times. Baal was also linked to the sun god Shamash as an arbiter of justice, with the moon goddess Nana regarding fertility and harvests, and with the grain goddess Shala. Over time, Baal Hadad also became associated with Dagon, or Dagon, the Phoenician lord of the gods, owing to his earlier link with Enlil, who had a similar role in Mesopotamia. At some point, he became central in divination rituals along with Shamash, most likely because both were associated with the concept of divine justice, and so would ensure a fair response to a person's prayers. By the time Baal Hadad's worship reached Ukarit, he was a major deity understood as a sky god who brought rain and was a friend of the life-giving sun. He is sometimes referenced as the son of El, the father of the gods, and was thought to live in a palace on Mount Zaphon, from where he controlled the winds and storms at sea and acted as a protector of mariners. A stela from Ugarit shows him with a club in one hand and a lightning bolt in the other, identifying him as a god of storms and war but he would primarily be associated with storms and rains throughout his worship at Ugarit, and even after Ugarit was destroyed around 1200 BCE. As a storm god, Baal is depicted as both a divine warrior and the provider of natural fertility in the form of dew and rains. His presence in the heavens is manifested by dark clouds, roaring winds, peals of thunder and bolts of lightning. Ugaritic myths depict Baal as victorious in battle against the primordial forces of the sea in the form of the god Yam, and death in the form of the god Mot. He is praised for his defeat of the dragons or sea monsters Lotan, the fleeing serpent, Tunan, and the seven-headed twisting serpent. Baal's distinctive iconography portrays him as a bearded god, wearing a conical hat with two horns, brandishing a mace or battle axe in his right hand, and grasping lightning and thunderbolts in his left. As king of the gods, Baal rules the cosmos under the authority of El, the grey-bearded patriarchal leader of the divine assembly. In Ugaritic poetry, 
Baal reigns over the gods, issues orders to gods and humans, and satisfies the multitudes of the earth with his fertilizing rains. While according to an epic from Akkad, Baal's absence from the world results in no dew, no downpour, no swelling of the deeps, no welcome voice of Baal to break the sweltering heat. Baal is also associated with the fertility of the herd, as is mythologically represented in two Ugaritic texts that describe his sexual intercourse with a cow, who then bears a son as his heir. Ugarit traded with many other ancient cities, including those of the Levant, where Baal Hadad seems to have travelled via trade. He became a central deity of the Canaanite pantheon which influenced Phoenician religion at some point. The Phoenician city of Baalbek, in modern-day Lebanon, was his cult centre, where he was worshipped with his consort Astarte, the goddess of love, sexuality and war, and who was associated with the Mesopotamian goddess Inanna Ishtar. See my link to a video on her down in the description. According to scholars, three goddesses appear regularly in the stories about Baal. Astarte, mentioned only in passing, Ashira and Anat. Of the three, the only goddess with a vivid character is Anat. She is Baal's sister and is closely identified with him as a successful opponent of Yam, Mot and other destructive powers. One of the most famous myths about Baal is the so-called Baal cycle from Ugarit. I'll leave a link to my video telling that story in the description below as well. The myth begins with Baal, son of Dagon, being confident that he will be chosen as king of the gods by El, father of the gods. El, however, chooses Yam, god of the seas, who subjugates the other gods and forces them into labour. The gods complain to Ashira, who agrees to intercede for them with Yam. She offers him all kinds of treasures, but he is only interested in sleeping with her. She agrees, but first returns to El and the Divine Court to inform them of their contract. All the gods support Ashira's decision to give herself to Yam, except Baal, who swears revenge on Yam for insulting Ashira in this way and promises to kill him. Yam then sends emissaries to the court demanding Baal's surrender. The other god showed the emissaries the utmost respect, but Baal refuses to bow and is disgusted by the behaviour of his fellow gods. Yam then sends a second delegation, who are arrogant and neglect the proper rituals due to El and the court. Baal wants to kill them for this affront, but he is held back by Anatra and Starte, who warn him against the sin of killing a messenger, who is only acting on orders and is therefore innocent. El does not move against the messengers either, but instead promises them that Baal will not only appear before Yam, but will bring in gifts, just like all the other gods do. Baal is enraged, but understands he is not powerful enough to defeat Yam in single combat. Kotarvachasis, the god of crafts, suggests a way, however, and creates two clubs for Baal, named Yagrush and Aimur. Kotarvachasis makes the weapons, and Baal goes to meet Yam. He strikes Yam on the shoulders with Yagrush, but Yam is unhurt. Baal then strikes Yam on the head with Aimur and defeats him. Baal is now king of the gods, but Mot, god of death in the underworld, objects and swears that he will devour Baal who surrenders to him. As Baal was the god of rain and fertility, the earth becomes barren in his absence, and Anat, swearing revenge, attacks and kills Mot. After El has a vision that Baal is alive, Shapash, the goddess of the sun, travels to the underworld to retrieve Baal, and so he is restored to life. Baal and Mot battle then, seemingly equal in strength, and Mot only surrenders when Shapash tells him that he will lose El's favour if he continues warring with Baal. And so Baal returns to his palace on Mount Zaphon and becomes king of all the world. The story is understood as illustrating a transition in power from the elder gods to a younger set, a familiar pattern in religious works of many different cultures. The transfer of power from an older sky god to a younger storm god is seen in other eastern Mediterranean cultures. Kronos was imprisoned and succeeded by his son Zeus, Yahweh succeeded El as the god of Israel. The Hurrian god Teshup assumed kingship in heaven after having defeated his father Kumarbi, and Baal replaced El as the effective head of the Ugaritic pantheon. The story also touches on the theme of order versus chaos, which is explored in famous myths like the Enuma Elish from Mesopotamia and the Osiris set cycle from Egypt. In both, 
order is threatened, and it is only by conquering the forces of chaos that it can be restored. In the Hebrew Bible, Baal is mentioned almost 100 times, and is best known from 1 and 2 Kings, which include the story of the Phoenician princess Jezebel, who encouraged his worship, and her struggle with the prophet Elijah, champion of the cult of Yahweh. Jezebel marries the Israelite king Ahab, who turns away from Yahweh to worship Baal. As Phoenician royalty and the daughter of a priest of Baal, Jezebel would have naturally brought her own gods to her new home. Jezebel and Elijah spar with each other for the supremacy of their respective faiths, until they agree the matter will be settled by a duel between the gods themselves, at the top of Mount Carmel. Jezebel's priests will call on Baal and Elijah on Yahweh, and whichever god responds by lighting the fire under a sacrificial bull will be recognized as the one true god. 850 priests of Baal call on him all day as they dance around the altar, while Elijah mocks them by asking where their god is and why he is not answering. When it is Elijah's turn, he calls out to Yahweh and fire comes down from heaven instantly, lighting the altar and consuming the offering. Elijah then proclaims Yahweh the winner and orders the priests of Baal to be executed. Jezebel refuses to acknowledge this victory, however, and continues to encourage the worship of Baal, as well as swearing revenge on Elijah, until she is killed on the orders of General Yahu. Afterwards, the cult of Yahweh proclaims him the only god, and the temples and shrines of Baal, Astarte, and the other Canaanite gods are destroyed. Baal worship continued in Israel, however, and other Bible narratives illustrate the struggle between traditional polytheism and emerging monotheism in the region. Baal's cult was eventually replaced by the cult of Yahweh, and his name became synonymous with the enemies of the one true God. In 2 Kings 1, Baal Sebub is associated with Ekron, god of the Philistines, the people famously cast as the enemies of Israel in the Bible. Baal Sebub would eventually become known as Beelzebub to the New Testament scribes, and be linked to the Christian devil, an association that would last up through to the time of the Protestant Reformation. By that time, Baal had also come to be associated with the figure of Iblis, the devil of Islam, through passengers in the Quran. Allah in Islam and Yahweh in Judaism and Christianity were recognized by their respective adherents as the only God, and Baal is an aspect of chaos, darkness, and evil who threatened world order. As always, thank you very much for watching. Please like, share and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Till next time, bye bye.